Ladies and gentlemen, go crazy if you will for the legend, the comedic genius that is Mr. Kevin Hart. Ah, what's up, everybody? How you doing? Oh, thank you, you too. Hey, hey, people. Hello. <laughs> oh. Can, well, we, can we just say hello to this girl over here who went, when she realized that you were here, she was hello. like, hi. That's good. Just that one right there. Right there. Hello, sweetie. How are you, Sugarfoot? How you doing? Is this oh, good? Just to be fair, though, we have got security just for her. That's um, it. <laughs> she is really worried. Hey, listen, welcome to London. Thank you, man. Uh, thank you for having me, London. Thank you. Don't don't thank them yet. Look, they're more excited about you than the iPhone 12. Or something. I, Look at them. I'm, I am I am a fan of London, so trust me, uh, I'm I'm just as excited as you guys are. And clearly, a massive fan of cricket. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm I'm trying to become a fan of cricket. I don't like how I don't like all the equipment that they make you put on because I, I had to take it all off, but it was so fast. Like literally, I put all his gear on and then he threw the ball and it hit the wicket thing and they were like, get undressed, you're done. <laughs> and I was like, I don't like that. To I, be I, fair, okay. <laughs> to be fair, you're supposed to stay in the game a little longer. Yeah, I don't know, they made me get undressed it's real fast. Not, don't get too excited by that game. Hey listen, welcome to London, but also, you were here to film, uh, let me explain. Yes. You sold out the O2. Yes, yes I, I mean, did, that's man. yes. Thank you. One Thank Direction you. can barely sell out the O2. I'm going to be so <laughs> hated for saying that. <laughs> but that's, in, that's incredible. Do you realize how popular you are around the world when you sell out gigs like that? Does that um, kind of reality hit? You know what? I, don't, I try not to think about that side of it. You know, uh, it's, it's amazing for me as an as a artist, as an entertainer, as a comedian to, uh, to, to basically see your fans come out in the way that they came out on this last tour. Uh, rather than sticking my chest out saying, wow, look at me and look at what I'm doing, it's more of an emotional an emotional thing because you, you realize that you're getting supported by people who genuinely love and appreciate your craft. Uh, that is what was huge for me. So coming over here and, and doing the O2 Arena, people don't understand, I've been coming to London for some time, so I've slowly built this fan base up, but I had no idea that those tickets would move the way that they did. And once I found out, I was just taken aback by it and thankful and realized how blessed I was and said, let me do what I do best and put on a damn good show. And in return, I did. So it was, it was fun. 10 countries, yes. 80, c uh, 80 cities, yes. $32 million in ticket sales. Yes. Number keep one. That, keep that down. <laughs> Number Keep one, <laughs> what was the best and worst city? And number two, can you lend me money? <laughs> uh, can you, you know lend what? her money? There's no. She there's looks oh, like she's got she's way in her. I saw her earlier. She uh, met me. You outside. say sweetheart, we yes. mean stalker. Well, no, no. You know what? There's no such thing. Fans, like I said, <laughs> are people who genuinely support you. This lovely young lady was outside of one of the buildings I was at and had something for me to sign. And I took a picture with her. See that? I remember everything. <laughs> Everything I remember. You seriously, just uh, started something. <laughs> so, what was the, which countries um, with the with outside of, of course, the U.S. mainly the European cities. Uh -huh. which, which cities get you? Which cities is it kind of tougher? And which cities are new you know to what? your work? The, I think the beautiful thing uh, about about where I am in my career now is that uh, I'm I'm universal, meaning I appeal to everyone. I don't have to change anything about me or my performance to adapt or fit into a particular environment. You know, uh, coming over here, I didn't feel like I need to talk different or slow down. Uh, when I went to Oslo or Sweden, Amsterdam, I didn't change anything. And I think that's the best thing about what I do is I'm being myself. So people are genuinely loving and appreciating you for being who you really are. Like, it's, it's not an act. This is my job, this is my craft, but what you see is what you get. So every city was the same in, in, in a performance level because I'm giving the same thing every night, which is my all. I'm not curbing it in any way, shape, or form. Do you want to do your English? I've heard your English accent. Do you want my to do your English? My English accent? Okay, listen. Tell, this is I'm brilliant. telling you all ahead of time, <laughs> it's awful. It's horrible. And I don't do it to, to be a jerk. I'm really <laughs> trying right now, okay? Uh, <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> 
What would you like to get some tea and some nutty butter and maybe and maybe take a trolley and eat a brisket and and just hang out? It's a little gloomy today. Uh, I like it because I'm in London. Uh, <laughs> And I want some nutty butter. I don't even know where I got <laughs> nutty butter from. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say it, but it sounds cool to me. Nutty <laughs> butter. I just want nutty butter and some tea. <laughs> and some tea <laughs> and some bangers and mash. That bangers and mash it. is the best thing ever. I like the way you avoided question number two as well. Can I borrow some money? I love oh, the way you got yeah, out. No, 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 that was I, good. I act like I didn't even hear it. Do your friends back in Philly, <laughs> <laughs> do your friends back in Philly kind of treat you differently now because you are, like, you are huge. Yeah, you know what's funny? Uh, I'm at that phase with my friends where they all, they all, they all have an invention. All of my friends have something that they need money for. But it's not just borrowing. Like, it's the weirdest, the weirdest stuff I've ever heard in my life. I had a friend who told me, and this is a very true story. He said that he needed a million dollars because he wanted me to invest in, a, in an idea that he had. So I said, look, I said, you're asking for a lot of money. I said, what, what, what is the idea? This is no BS. He said, brace yourself. <laughs> Fat mannequins. <laughs> I said, what? What? What are you talking? What? What did you just say? <laughs> he said, think about it. All you ever see is skinny mannequins. You don't think that people want to see fat mannequins? Clothes on a fat mannequin save time. <laughs> and it's, here's, here's what's bad about it. It's not a bad idea. <laughs> like it's, it's not a bad idea, but I just don't see myself giving money. But when you really think about it, I was like, there's a market for that. Like I'll be, there's, I'm going to be honest. Good. I haven't thought about it for a while. Um, there's a market for it. But I, I get hit with those things all day. <laughs> but you have to pick and choose. And what you do is you pick two people and you do a favor for them. You, you give out money financially and then those people are your examples of why you can never do it again. I would love <laughs> to give you money, but I gave Keisha money and she ain't gave it back yet. And she's ruined it for everybody. So don't nobody ask me for nothing. That's all you need is two examples. And I imagine that Christmas they expect slightly better presents from you, right? Oh, my, my family, uh, my family's ridiculous when it comes to gifts. Like, uh, two Christmases ago, I go back to Philadelphia and I bring gifts. So we're doing like this Pollyanna thing where everybody's passing out gifts and they get to my gift and it's like a drum roll. They're like, <laughs> oh. And I was like, wait, don't do that. It's nothing. It's, <laughs> it's a DVD. It's my <laughs> DVD. <laughs> I didn't even buy you anything. I just signed a <laughs> DVD that I had for free. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm pretty cheap when you think about it, guys. Uh, we have to ask this because uh, we kind of, I guess most of us have seen this now, Miley Cyrus, Sunday Night. Oh, oh. Wow. <laughs> right? You were there, man. You were yes, there. Yes. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. First of all, hey, we're not going to recreate it. Seriously. I'll be Miley. That ain't never happening, sister. Um, well, number one, were you supposed to be hosting? Because I heard that you weren't even supposed to be hosting and no, you just saved the night. No, I just, uh, they Jedi mind tricked me. You know, <laughs> that's, why, that's why I kept saying I'm not hosting. I don't <laughs> want people to think that I'm hosting. Uh, I just have a great relationship with MTV and their producers. So they wanted me to go up and literally just freelance some stuff and talk about the performances and just kind of announce the Voters' Choice Awards. Um, Miley, Miley's performance... Uh, <laughs> Here, here's the thing, okay? <laughs> here's the thing. You got to understand this. Miley is 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 in a position now where she doesn't want to be the Disney girl anymore, <laughs> which which I understand. She's a grown woman. She's growing up, and she wants to be considered as an adult. And the, it's a hard transition to make. So right now, she's doing raunchy, crazy things to get out of that childlike phase, which I get. My problem, I don't like that people keep saying she's twerking. <clears throat> she, she's not twerking. Like, like, excuse the language, you, you need a fat ass to twerk. Like, <laughs> Molly don't have ass. So it's, it's mainly just a bunch of bones doing some stuff. So I just hate, I just hate when they go, like everything she does, the public says it's twerking. Like, she was walking, they say, look at Molly twerk. No, she's, 
she's walking down the carpet. That's all <laughs> she's doing. And then she'll stop and like. <laughs> It's just weird. It's not it's not twerking. That's the only thing I get mad at. Like, I'm the only person that's frustrated. Like, that's not <laughs> twerking! She's not twerking. Uh no, but her performance, her performance definitely opened up some eyes. I think the funniest reaction is when they showed the, the Smith family. And but it was all of them. It was like a whore. Like it was like it was like they all just saw the worst horror movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> Gum came out of Willow's mouth. <laughs> that was the funniest reaction to me. Will's like, Jaden, you're never seeing that yeah, girl it again. Was, it was definitely, it was definitely <laughs> something to laugh at. But I, like I said, I understand where she is right now, and it's just making that transition. She's going to be fine. I just want them to stop saying that she's twerking. That's it. That's it. Uh, you got to. Um, I didn't realize this until recently. Uh, Judd Apatow. Kind yes. of discovered you, right? Yes, he did. Yes, how, he did. How did that come about? I mean, that's amazing. Judd Apatow, um, Judd Apatow had a pilot. Uh, for those who do not know what a pilot is, before before TV shows get to television, their ideas and these studios spend money on shooting one episode. There's a show called North Hollywood. This is really crazy. Um, it was Jason Siegel, Amy Poehler, myself. Um, we were the leads of this particular pilot. So I had to go to LA and live with Jason Siegel for two months. Um, and it was weird, uh, mainly because he was white and I, I never lived <laughs> with a white guy. And I just remember Jason like, this is gonna be cool, man. We're gonna do cool stuff like cook pancakes. And I was like, I'm not cooking no damn pancakes, man. I don't, I don't wanna cook with you. He said, but we have to do this for the show. This is how we, we have to become friends so it's better for the show. And Judd Apatow literally gave me the opportunity of a lifetime by putting this guy who had no acting experience at all in his television show. And me, Jason, and Amy did it. The show never got picked up, but we had a great friendship. And years later, we all just started to blossom separately. But it was from Judd Apatow putting us in a position where we can be seen from other Hollywood directors and producers. And Judd actually is responsible for why I got so much work in LA, that piece of tape there. So me and Judd until his day are very close, but I owe him a lot, man, a we, whole lot. We got to uh, to talk with Seth Rogen a couple of weeks ago for This Is The End, <laughs> which you, you last, I think it's 45 seconds. Yeah, you know, Seth lied to me. <laughs> I, I asked him, I said, hey man, he said, Kev, can you do me a favor? I want you to be in the movie. I said, all right, well, what, what is it? He said, well, it's a movie where basically all the all the celebrities in Hollywood go to this party and something happens and then we all die. And I was like, well, I don't want to be the black guy that dies <laughs> first. And he was like, no, I would never do that to you. Trust me, you're not. I would never do that. And he killed Aziz before me. And I was technically like the second black guy to die. And he didn't even give me a dramatic death. Like I hopped into the hole and died. Like. Nobody hit me with anything. He's like, yeah, it'll be cool. I was like, ah, I feel like somebody should push me. He's like, no, this is going to be decent the way I do it. And he lied. He made it seem like there was going to be some green screen effects. I just grabbed my foot and hopped in a hole. It was the <laughs> dumbest death I've ever seen. And I deserve to die better. I definitely he, deserve to die better in that film. He genuinely said that he, he actually said the reason why he wanted you to die. This is what he said to me. <laughs> the reason why he wanted you to die so quickly was because you were too funny. And if you couldn't do the whole movie, you were doing very little. That is movie. so racist. <laughs> 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 Seth no, Rogen. Okay. Rogen, not me. Rogen, no, not me. Seth, Seth is a, a really good friend of mine. We're actually about to do a movie together soon. So uh, it was it was a it was a great concept. I love the fact that we all got to be ourselves in the movie. And and Seth is doing amazing things, man. That's one guy that I'm beyond proud of. Like he directed and wrote and produced. This is the end. People don't understand how huge that is. I mean, Seth is 30, 30 years old maybe, and taking over Hollywood at a young age. So I take my hat off. So I'm just glad I can be a part of the project. Um, well, let's talk about this movie. Let's talk um, about it. You self-funded this movie. Sure did. What were you thinking? Well, Someone else's money. No, here's Surely. the thing. Here's the thing with using your own money. <laughs> you don't have to hear other people's mouths. Uh, you control it. I'm, I'm very big on, on branding myself. Uh, I'm very big on um, independent, independent moves. You know, 
uh, taking this entrepreneur thing by storm. So when you look at where I am in my career, uh, I have a company, which is Heartbeat Productions, and I think the best thing that I have that some people don't is a product that I believe in, which is myself. So to gamble on myself is a no-brainer. So I took my own money, I took $2.5 million, funded it, teamed up with a company called Cold Black, uh, who I did Laugh for My Pain and Seriously Funny with, uh, produced it ourselves, shot it ourselves, and then teamed up with Lionsgate to distribute it. But I own my own movie, which is unheard of. You know, when you look at a lot of these comedians of the past who have done things, we don't own our content or our product. And that's very important to me to own my catalog. So laugh at my pain, seriously funny, and now let me explain. These are all things that I own. But going theatrically, I put it out, I distribute it. The reason why I can do that with Lionsgate is because of social media. You look at Twitter, you look at Facebook, you look at Instagram. Uh, these are things that I love and that I'm very, very active with. I don't need a major studio to come in and spend a bunch of money and produce my stuff because I have a direct connect to my fan base. You all knew I would be here because of social media. Hey, I'm going to be at the Apple store. Come say hi. Sin. Hey, <coughs> hey, my movie's coming out. Go see it. Sin. The first 200 people to meet me at my movie theater, you're getting free popcorn and a movie ticket, and I want to talk to you afterwards. Sin. I have a direct connect. So... My way of promotion is has kind of taken the industry by storm. I mean, right now in the States, let me explain. We put it out on 850 theaters, and we've grossed almost $30 million, $33 million uh, to date off of a $2.5 million investment. It's unheard of. But the beautiful thing is I own it. It's mine. <laughs> so nobody can say anything about it. And it's very good to do this and talk about it to younger people so you guys can understand it's so easy to put your mind to stuff and actually achieve it once you see that that dream can become reality. That's where I am right now. I realize that my dreams can easily become reality and I'm achieving them because I'm putting my mind to them. And I'm so focused right now and so, so concentrated on doing things from within my own company and developing things myself that I can see myself becoming a serious made man in Hollywood. Tyler Perry had the same vision, and he's literally the most richest man in Hollywood right now as far as grossing potential of what he's done. It's, it's something that everyone can do once they realize that it can be done. Social media makes it easier for me. The fact that we can all talk to each other through FaceTime and Skype and all of these other things where I can have a direct connect to my fans, that's what I love. And that's the world that I take upon storm because no other actor really embraces it the way that I embrace it. Justin Bieber, Rihanna, they do, which is why their numbers are so huge when they go out. Because they really care about their fans. That's where I'm at with it mentally right now. Um, with such, I mean, you've done comedy for such a long time mm -hmm. now. I, I don't know if this is true, but I read that you kind of forget every bit of comedy that you've done, yes. except for the stuff you're working on. I throw it all away. How does that work? Because you're borderline a rock star of comedy. And you, when, you, know, you know when you go and see a band and you want them to do the classics. Do people scream out gags for you to do? No, no, I would kick them out. <laughs> uh, okay, no. just a personal <laughs> note there for a few thousand of you. Uh, no, I think, I think as a comedian, the one thing that we don't have the ability to do is, is uh, repeat jokes over and over again. You know, the internet has messed that up for us because when you guys have seen the same jokes over and over again and then you come and see me live and I'm doing exactly what you saw me do, I'm cheating you. You spent good money to come see me perform, so you should see something that you feel is worth your money. Me not being creative and taking the time to produce new content isn't doing you any justice as a fan. So whenever I do an hour, after an hour goes to theatrical or, or television, I, I mentally get rid of it. And now I have to rebuild and create another hour. So when you guys come see me again, you'll respect my work ethic and say, he actually gives a shit. He cares. He's not just ripping people off and doing the same thing over and over again. And that's what I pride myself on. It takes me a long time to get a new hour of material. Um, it takes me about a year wow. to a year and a half to actually develop a strong hour. Let me explain. Let me explain took at least a year and a half before I was so confident with it that I could take it in arenas. You got to think, you're telling jokes in front of 16 to 20,000 people. And at times, it's quiet. 
That's scary. If, if, <laughs> if, if you say a joke and you don't get that reaction, beads of sweat will run down my ass. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that problem. So I make sure I prepare. I make sure that I, I'm, I'm well versed and I can do my set inside and out. And it takes preparation and time. And uh, I think after doing it so much, I've built up a nice, a nice form, a nice, uh, a nice work pattern that where I can repeat it after each cycle. So right now, literally, after I'm done filming my next movie, we'll start revamping my new hour. But it, it's going to take some time. Wow. Uh, would you like to see another clip of the movie? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this, this yeah. is, this is just. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's like, oh, really again? Uh, this I'm is so brilliant. sick of seeing this damn movie. <laughs> no, this bit's brilliant. This, this is genuinely hilarious. This is uh, what can only be described as bum hand. Take a look at this. <laughs> Yo, bum bum. <laughs> <laughs> can we uh, can we talk about the outfit? Yes. Because th here's the thing, right? So I, you guys, I, there's far too many young people in here that probably don't even remember. But when I was a kid, I illegally watched Eddie Murphy because <laughs> I kind of wasn't old enough to watch it and we got hold of little pirate videos and Eddie Murphy was rocking, you probably remember this, I'm sure you do, the red leather. Yes, yes. Wrong in every sense of the word right now, right? Yes. But, but kind of 20 years ago, that was iconic. That yes. was seen as it. Uh, uh, do you take that much care into what you're wearing now because you know it's going to be on celluloid and it's going to be on movies for, for another uh, 20 years? Of course. I mean, um, first of all, I, I wear leather in all of my specials, with the exception of I'm a grown little man. <laughs> um, the reason why I didn't wear it and I'm a grown little man, I didn't have the money at the time <laughs> to get anything leather. So I had to make do with what I had, which was a black button-up shirt at the time. Um, but it's my way of paying homage to, quote-unquote, the greats. You know, Eddie Murphy set a bar uh, by wearing that leather. Uh, it was, it was rock star-ish. And that's why I get the whole comedic rock star thing. It's all stemming from what Eddie Murphy has done and, and, and the pedestal that, that that man sits on by himself. Um, after him, you know, so many comedians have blessed the stage by wearing leather. And I think it's all paying tribute to Eddie Murphy to some degree. Um, Richard Pryor, of course, was before him and set a different bar and is on a completely different pedestal. But for me, it's just paying homage to the guys who have opened up the door that I'm now able to walk through and kind of laid the blueprint. Uh, so I, I pay so much attention to what I'm wearing. And it's always going to be black. It's always going to be some form of leather. I try to go against that. I did the gray leather on Laugh My Pain, and it went well. But I just felt like I looked ashy for the whole <laughs> thing. So I went back to black on this one. So uh, I'll, I'll probably stick with black, man. But it, it definitely is, is, is a uh, significant way of me paying homage to those before me. So I pay very, very close attention. And I'm a clothes, I'm a clothes whore. I love clothes. Uh, love we have so many people that have a question for you. Should we, could we, let's open it up to the floor. Uh, who has a question? What if we nobody had to raise their hand? Can you imagine? <laughs> this many millions <laughs> of people so turn up people. and none of them have a question. <laughs> uh, what about this guy down here? Because he's been waving for about 20 minutes with his good arm. <laughs> he's only got, I don't even want to know what happened to you, fella. Yeah. What's um, your question? I just want to say, what, Oh, what do you think the most important part of being a good screen actor is? Uh, what is the most important part of being a good screen actor? I wish I could answer that question. Um, I'm still learning as I go. You know, I think uh, I'm a guy who got lucky. By lucky, I mean uh, I think I have a natural talent when it comes to comedic acting and, and improvisation. In no way, shape, or form am I a trained thespian. You know, I didn't go to school for it. I didn't study it. Um, but I would say confidence is, is, is what can drive any machine. Confidence is what can make anybody great in what they do. So for me, being confident about walking into those, uh, walking into those projects and, and working with the people that I'm working with have definitely helped me. Um, I would say if you don't have that, you don't have nothing. You know, If you don't think that you should be there, if you don't think you're good at what you're attempting to do, then you're going to lose before you even start. So confidence to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's let's pass the mic just along, shall we? Just this guy here. Um, who do you think is the greatest stand-up comedian? Who do I think is the greatest stand-up comedian? I don't think you can pick just one. Um, they're, they're all great for so many different reasons. Not to take up too much time on this question because it's a, it's a long answer for me. Uh, Richard Pryor is great because he was before his time. 
uh, Eddie Murphy is great because he he took the art of of talking about your family and painting pictures to a completely different level. Bill Cosby is great because he made having a family cool. Dave Chappelle is great because he is a person who takes the most common sense thoughts and, and makes you see him in such a completely different aspect of the world. It's somewhat genius. Chris Rock is great because he makes talking about politics amazing. Uh, I mean, I can go down this list all day. Jerry Seinfeld's great because he talks about nothing and, <laughs> and makes you listen to it, and it's funny. George Carlin was great because he did 10 different specials, and, and there was new material on each special. The Kings of Comedy were great because they came in and did what was never done and achieved the unthinkable on a tour and maximized uh, an amount of ticket sales that, that people didn't think could be done with, with comedians. Um, Bernie Mac, rest in peace. Great just because he made cussing cool. I don't care what <laughs> nobody says. I can go down this list all day, man. It's, it's literally uh, picking your poison. But for me, I can't, I can't choose just one. Um, what keeps you motivated or who inspires you to do better? Who inspires me to do better? Um, right now, my, my kids. Uh, I have two people that I'm responsible for. So, you know, my success is their success. Whatever legacy or, or platform I'm building now and attempting to step on is for them. You know, the name Hearts has to live on when I'm not here. And that name is going to be instilled in them. So... I would say my kids. My kids are my biggest motivation right now. Do your kids? Do, you, do your kids kind of go to school going? You know, my daddy. My daughter. <laughs> my daughter right now is at that age where she knows. Like, <laughs> it, it's scary because she knows. Like, she asks questions. Dad. Um, so you're famous, right? And it's it's weird because I don't know how to handle them sometimes. I just tell her to shut up. Like that's, <laughs> that's what I do. So you know. <laughs> Like, she'll, she'll say, I'm telling you, man, my daughter's so intelligent, it's scary. Uh, Dad, everybody loves you because you're on TV, right? And that makes you cool, so am I cool? <laughs> shut up. <Just laughs> shut up. Uh, but my son has no idea. My son's clueless. I don't, my son just loves his dad. But my daughter's definitely starting to put the pieces to the puzzle together. So, you know, that's why I make sure that I have him around and make sure they understand what I do and why I work so hard. Uh, that's very important to me, uh, that they process that information correctly because if it goes bad, it can be a scary thing with kids. Uh, let's get some more questions. There's some people, like this lovely lady over here. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Hey, boo. Hey, boo-boo. <laughs> <laughs> if you two want to be alone, because we, we can all go. Actually, she'd like that. I know it's not safe. Yeah, all right. Um. <laughs> Uh huh. So, out of his albums, I wanted to know what are your top three? My top three. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that is a that is a great question. You I know mean, what? I'm gonna say Reasonable Doubt is number one. Okay. Okay. Um, after Reasonable Doubt, I'm actually gonna go with the Blueprint. After that, and then I'm going to go Holy Grail. Yeah. Here's why. Oh. Here's why I say Holy Grail. Uh, you have to understand what makes Jay Z. So amazing. Yes, he's a gifted and talented rapper, but Jay Z is a is a person who dictates what's cool and what's not cool to a generation of people. Uh, that's more than just skill. He's a man who has set the bar so high in life for people to follow him. This is something to really think about. This is what Jay Z has done. Jay-Z, at one point, had everybody wearing throwback jerseys. He then decided that that wasn't as mature as it should be. He's done with that world. I want the world to start wearing button-up shirts. After he told you to wear button-up shirts, you know what? I don't want the world to think that being a drug dealer is cool. Being a businessman is what it's about. I just became a businessman. I now own restaurants and liquor. The reason why I own liquor is because I got mad at a certain liquor for doing something I thought was racist, so I created my own and made that liquor surpass the liquor that I thought that you hated. <laughs> After doing that, Jay-Z said, you know what? Man, I am into sports. I want to be involved with a basketball team. I want to show the young youth that are around and fans of me that this can happen. 
I did that. Now that I did that, you know what I want to do? I want to be a sports agent. Why do I want to be a sports agent? Because I can, and I want to try to be the best at it. He constantly, he constantly raises the bar for himself. And at the same time, he stays relevant in music by constantly reminding you that he's the best. Every time you forget that Jay-Z is the best, he puts an album out or a song out and smacks you on the head and goes, don't forget about me. It's the most amazing thing in the world. I mean, you just witnessed the same thing with Justin Timberlake at the VMAs. Just when you forgot about Justin Timberlake or thought that Justin Timberlake was around but not really around, he did a 20-minute live concert at the VMAs and in the middle of it said, don't forget, I'm the king, bitch, and, and, <laughs> and slam the microphone and you go, whoa. He really is. He let NSYNC perform for 30 seconds and sit them back down a hole. It's, 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 it's mind boggling, but when you think about it, it's really what has happened. So for Jay-Z, I, I, have a, I have a different respect for him as a friend and as a fan. That, that man is a, he's, he's, he's a Hall of Fame type person. And to understand why, you really got to look at his ball of work, man. You have to. Anchors Tom Ford is one of the greatest records ever made. Oh, um, <laughs> should we go over there? Should we go behind? Let's go and pick someone over there. How do the people you mention in your tour feel? Uh, how do they feel? Ooh. Well, here's the good news. Um, I'm honest. I, I talk about what I go through in life, whether it's good or bad. Uh, I put it all out there. Now... What you all have to realize is I never talk about anybody in a negative way. It's always self-deprecating. It all goes back to me. So my ex-wife can't be upset because I'm talking about my mistakes in our relationship. I don't bash her because at the end of the day, that's the mother of my kids. I'm always going to love and respect her as the mother of my kids. Uh, she knows that. She understands that. My dad being on drugs... Uh, he was on drugs. Uh, I don't, I don't talk about him in a, in a vicious way. I paint a picture for people to see who he was and what I had to deal with, with being around my dad. Um, my mother, uh, passing away. Everything goes back to me and what my reactions were. So nobody really gets upset. Only people that can get mad are my kids. And I take care of them, so they got to shut up. <laughs> uh, but my son, when he gets older, uh, realizes that I called him dumb a couple times. He'll, he'll probably have some words. But other than that, I've never had a problem. And I, I make sure that I never talk about anybody in a malicious way to where it comes off bad. It's always fun, and it always reverts back to me. Even when I talked about Dwayne Wade and the whole stay in your lane, it came back to me and my reaction to the, to the situation that they put me into. Uh, great question. Let's see. There's a guy waving over there. Kind of got the Will Smith ears going on. Yeah. No, that's a... Hey! Come that's on! Hey. He does. He does. <laughs> he does. Thanks, buddy. Um, the worst bit is... That one, she just yeah. went, him. <laughs> she didn't even pretend to go like, could it be him? Cool. You, sir. Yeah, my name's Travis J. I'm a comedian. How you doing, man? What's going on? I just want to ask, what advice do you have for a young comedian coming up? Uh, the advice that I would give you, man, and I hate giving out advice because I, I, I'm still in a position where I'm learning every day. So I never like to feel like I'm above anybody to where you have to listen to what I say because this is right and you don't know what you're talking about. I don't like that. So my advice to you would be be yourself. I learned that uh, very late in the game. I've been doing comedy now for 19 years almost. Uh, the beauty of being yourself is that Nobody can tell you that you're not doing what you feel you should do when you know your own stories. Nobody can tell you what's funny about the life that you know. Um, when I first started out, I was trying to be other people. I was trying to be characters. And I didn't understand that I personally was funny. If you're being a comedian, you're doing it because you personally are funny. Be yourself, understand who you really are, and once you find that voice, it's going to come so easy to you. And I think the, the comedians that struggle early on are the ones that are trying to do what they feel like people want to see instead of doing what they want people to see. You get what I'm saying? And I hope that made sense. Yeah. If not, I apologize. <laughs> I don't, I do you have, do you, let me just ask you, do you have people close to you, though, that will kind of go, 
Kevin, this this works, this doesn't, yeah. this works. Or, or are you do you have that ability that you can watch stuff back and go, I need to tone that or hone that in? I have uh, I have two of my closest friends that work with me, that travel with me, uh, Harry Ratchford, Joey Wells. And these guys are my writers. So basically what they do is I come up with so much stuff, but I don't write. I don't like to sit and just write stuff down. I like to get on stage and talk. But as I'm talking, I say so much stuff, I don't ever want to forget it. So these guys jot down everything that I say. So when I get off stage, we go over the notes and we dictate what was funny, what wasn't funny. And then when I go back up again, they say, Kevin, talk about this stuff again. So I'll go on stage with a piece of paper and I'll literally put it on a stool and I'll just run down a list. And eventually it just sticks in my head to where it's memorized. And I just keep reciting the same stuff over and over again and we all punch it up together. But it's a system. It's a system where I have guys that I trust that know my voice and know what my version of funny is and just sit and write and, and know what gems are and what I would like and what I wouldn't. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, can we go this side, nah, somewhere this nah. side? Let's pass the mic. Can we pass the mic back to that? Uh, hang on. Shirt it's not an, it's, hang on, we're in the wrong shop. <laughs> ah, look, I'm trying to figure it out. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I just have a stylist. So uh, at times when I can't get stuff and I have events like this, I ask her to go grab a couple outfits for me. But if I were to get it, I probably would have had my daughter paint it and, and, and then do it and wear it for my baby girl. But this is, uh, this is something that was picked out for me, so I can't take credit for it. And he can't take it off. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Uh, Kevin, uh, major fan. Thank you, All man. Right. Uh, back to the Jay-Z thing. I know that Jay-Z is a, you're a great big fan of Jay-Z, right? I get that. I get that. But do you think Chocolate Dropper <laughs> can take <laughs> Jay-Z in a freestyle? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me wait. Uh, because I saw uh, you, what you did to T-Pain. Uh -huh. That was incredible. <laughs> do you think Chocolate Dropper can take Jay-Z in a freestyle? Here's the thing that you guys... I have to understand about my friend Chocolate Dropper, okay? <laughs> Chocolate Dropper is pound for pound, probably the dopest MC to, to ever touch a microphone. And the reason why he is the dopest MC to ever touch a microphone, because Chocolate Dropper has no fear, you know? You're talking about a guy who was raised by a female pit bull, literally. <laughs> uh, and, and he's now he's now ventured into the world of rap. And so many have stepped up to the plate. And so many have failed. But, you know, he's aggressive because he's been through a lot. Like, you know, so many people have, have, have tried to sign Chocolate Drop and, and offer him great money. But at the end of the day, he doesn't want money. He wants blood, you know? <laughs> Uh, and, and taking MCs down is what he lives for. So, you know, Jay-Z has actually tried to sign him on numerous occasions, and, and he told Jay to kiss his ass, you know? Uh, I, I can only hope that within time he loses a lot of the hostility that he has and understands that, you know, the rap game is not a long-term situation for him, uh, and to do better, he's going to have to treat people better. But he's actually... He's, uh, he's in North Dakota at a community college uh, <laughs> doing a daytime show as we speak. So he's got a lot of gigs, man. Stuff is going for this guy. It's really good. Really, really good for him. Uh, really, really good for him. Hey, I'm, I'm not chocolate dropper. <laughs> Y'all think, think that I'm chocolate dropper. I'm not. I'm not. You gotta, if you look at his clothes, look at his eyebrows and look at mine. You're looking at two different eyebrows. His, his right eyebrow is on his left side, and his left one <laughs> is on his right side. But I'm more, I'm more of a singer, actually, myself. Like, I'm, I'm more of a falsetto. Like that's, that's my world. Dropper is a completely different ballpark, man. So I just, I just don't like to cross the two worlds. I'm, I'm a nice guy. You see how approachable I am and well-spoken? That guy has no cooth. He's he's an animal. He, it's it's because he was raised by a female pit bull. So, 
I'm sorry. That that's the truth, there, man. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry, but we <laughs> have to. He's no, such no. a busy man. Um, oh. I can't thank you enough oh. for coming out. Amazing oh. questions. Be upstanding. Go nuts. Go crazy yeah. for the legend. That is Kevin Hart. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Thank you, man. This is cool. Thank you, man.